And welcome back to Beards of War. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to review a movie that is currently out in theaters. Dune 2. 2024 is Dune 2. I was the, directed by Dennis Villanueva. And the cinematography is by Greg Frazier. We also want to give a shout out to those key grips. That is Quasi Harb, Robert Fisher, Guy Micheletti, and Attila Souks. Now, this movie is basically a continuation of Dune 1. Uh, as you know, there was also an original Dune back in, I believe, 1984, uh, based on the novel, the 1965 novel by Frank Herbert. Uh, basically follows Paul Atreides and Shani as they unite to try to fight, wage war against the Harkin, Harkonnen family uh, who destroyed Atreides' family. Uh, so basically he has that, you know, the, the, the task of choosing love, or revenge in the destruction of the universe. We've all been there. All right, so we're going to get into it, but before that, let's get a word from our sponsor. Hey, guys. The sponsor of today's show is Roan Industries. It's a veteran-owned company that strives to provide better gear for better operators. To do this, they design products with only necessary moving parts, no excess fluff, and simple functionality. So when you get to the checkout section, be sure to put BOW in all caps to get 15% off of any of the gear that they have from our brothers over at Roan. Thanks, guys. All right, hey, guys, welcome back. Make sure you check out our sponsor, but right now we're going to go ahead and announce, should be said, spoiler alert, okay? Uh, we're going to roll right into a recap of the first one. So the first one uh, basically starts out with Paul Atreides uh, and his dad. They're they're all they're moving the whole family and the, the, the uh, Atreides uh, tribe over to... Um, planet arrakis i believe arrakis, arrakis thank jesus yeah. uh so they're going to arrakis right so uh basically the emperor of the universe has tasked them to go out and uh mine spice uh, this all-powerful thing that's found in the sand that basically fuels everything in the universe and it's a highly highly sought after commodity uh that being said the harkonnens a warring tribe uh with against the atreides tribe uh basically go in there and declare war. They take over and uh, look to eradicate the um, Paul and his entire family, their bloodline. Uh, so a skirmish happens, some twists happen, people betray other people, lots of people die. Really good movie, wholesome family film. Um, but what that leaves us off with is basically that Paul and his mother are, um, they're basically walking out into the desert trying to make their, their escape from the Harkonnens. Dad dies a, a, a valiant death trying to defend his family, tries to kill the Baron, uh, things like that. Uh, so basically, at the end of the movie, Paul and his mother are found by the Fremen, the, the local desert tribe of the uh, of, of Arrakis, and uh, not quite so much welcomed into their community, but basically they're, they're, they're taken so they can be further investigated. Um, and then after a quick uh, show of force from the Fremen versus uh, Paul, he wins their respect by killing one of their senior warriors, and we kind of cut to black, and then it, it basically sets up the exact uh, the starting point for the sequel. So that's where we're going to begin. Yeah, guys. Uh, yeah, it's amazing, I think, how they did this. They did a, I think they did a great job in tying this to the very ending of the, uh, the first one. Um, as Grant mentioned, right where the, the first one ended, this one picks up, right? The mom, the son are out in the desert right up against, uh, you know, rocks and everything, just trying to hide and stay out of viz of uh, some of the Harkonnens or Harkonnens, however they pronounce that. I'm sure those guys wouldn't like the way I pronounce but I, I really don't care. I'm sure the comments will brutalize us for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be some people that know the language. It's got it all down. But, uh, yeah, so, they're, you know, they're trying to hide – and oddly enough, uh, the son, right, Atreides, he's, so he's hiding up against the rock, and then he decides to go out and fight one of the guys that, that turn around because there's, um, I think it was sandworms that were, were coming at that time, and they, all, they got these great suits where they can just fly. I mean, the CGI on this was insane. So these guys get up to the top of this mountainous rock heap where the, the, uh, where, um, the mom and the son are, and... And they start getting sniped and they're falling they're like bodies are falling you know something like uh what was that world war z when the bodies were falling all over the place so they start falling and then one guy comes down and land with his his back to uh the mom and the son he decides i'm gonna go for it especially once the guy turns around and he goes after a knife on a dead body does a pretty good job fighting and ends up standing over top of this cat 
um, with his back to the dune. Now, the interesting part on that for me was that dune, it was pretty high. It was at least a good 100 meters to the top. His mom was still down by the rocks when he was doing this. Somehow, she just knew on the other side of that, that dune, that berm, there happened to be another soldier that was going to come up behind him because she pops up out of nowhere, pregnant, with a rock that probably weighed, I don't know, 100 pounds and smashed this guy's head in. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out how quickly she got up there. That CGI probably, but all in all, uh, yeah, it was really interesting how they tied it. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think on that? Well, I like the HVAC suits, man. I call them HVAC suits because it looked like they had an entire air conditioner on their back. Um, but just the 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 cinematography of the entire movie was was on point. Um, it looked real. It looked believable. It didn't look like oh man, that's a bunch of you know fake green screen or anything like that. Um, the the sand, the amount of the vastness of of the back of the cinematography was was excellent. Um, of course, you know, following you know our, our our main characters and their fight and their and their attacks and their planned attacks on on some of these uh, um, fights were incredibly you know it was incredibly done like their TTPs were on point and this is like him he's doing it with a small number of people you know it's like basically a QRF you know he did, he doesn't have an army and uh, I just thought the way they carried it out uh, was was very good it was, it was very entertaining the movie overall was just really really good. Yeah, I got to say that if you're looking for a reason to come back to the movie theaters, this is it. And when I tell you that I don't like spending money on big screens, this is the movie to do it. Um, I didn't see Oppenheimer in theaters, uh, but I tell you what, I, I wish I had just to, to appreciate the scope. But this movie just knocks it out of the park, man. And mark my words, this is going to be an Academy Award. This is like Lord, of the, Return of the King kind of good. Um, and I, I know that's a bold statement, but man... I loved every minute of it. And the movie's like two hours and 45 minutes long. You just don't feel it. Um, this is my opinion. The guys might be different. Absolutely loved it. Um, but moving it forward from that one sequence that Chris introduced, like basically the movie kind of covers Paul's trials and tests to, to be uh, revered as the chosen one by the Fremen people. And his mom does this awesome manipulation game where she becomes um, pretty much the equivalent to a high priestess of a religion. Um, I think she earns the title of Reverend Mother. I don't know. Put in the comments. Correct me if I'm wrong, yep. please. I hate being <laughs> jacked up. Anyways, uh, her manipulation game is actually something that's truly amazing to watch. Like Rebecca Ferguson, if you've never seen her and stuff, she's been in like the it Apple show Silo and uh, some of the Mission Possibles. But her acting in this movie, I think, is flawless. Like if she was looking for a role that captures what she's capable of doing on film, like she knocks it out of the park. You're almost rooting for her to not win because she's – just a really good conniving character that right. she just can't help for but root for. I mean, is there part of it that's rooting for a kid to, to be this this uh, idol, or is is she just manipulating the universe because that's what their sect of this religion does? Um, it could go both ways, and if you get to the end, you'll know exactly where she stands, and it's fantastic. Uh, but the other half of this is pretty much the Harkonnens' perspective. Uh, Dave Batista, man, uh, gotta love him for acting in this movie too because. Kids, put your earmuffs on. He is a <laughs> giant bitch in this movie. All right? Yeah. Like, for what his stature is, you'd think he'd be this big, imp imposing dude. And in this movie, he's not. His character's well-written. Like, I love it. Like, I would argue that it's, it's hard to find which actor you enjoyed their performance the most. Uh, oh, I got one. Oh, oh, Harvey, Harvey Bardem. Bardem. All day. Yep. All day, man. Still what? Yeah. All three of us agreed on that? That's yeah. insane. Harvey Bardem was like the old dude. school... Yep. Oh, that's a sign. Nope. Oh, nope. Oh, I told you he's the chosen one. And every time it was like, no, that's a coincidence. Nope. He's the chosen one. It was it, it always fit. He was always right there to see it. And I was like, ah. Oh. And Zendaya's character, you know, uh, Chani, she's like, no, it's not true. It's not what it is. He's like, nope. It's he's chosen. And it was so freaking coincidental that it always happened right in front of him. So you couldn't deny it. You know. So he's just sitting there like, I knew it. I knew he was the chosen one. The whole thing with the sandworms. Sandworms will, you'll get a different perspective of travel after watching Dune Two. I will, I will say that that oh, yeah, scene of him uh, wrangling a, a sandworm was amazing. But then you get to see that that's basically their form of mass transit. But that was good. Harvey Barton was my favorite character. Yeah, Paul Paul Atreides, uh, yeah, obviously the the main actor in that. Um, you know, of course, throughout for a while. Uh, he was denying that he was a messiah, you know. Uh, well, and I knew the name of him. 
uh, what what was the, the name? Timothy Chalamet. No, no, the no. the oh, what, what they, they called, called him. Ursula. Ursula. Or no, what they called. Ursula. The Messiah. No, no, no. Well, that's that long name it, that they gave him. Is it Madahi? Yeah, the Mugadim or whatever Mugadim. Muadib, that's it. Well, Muadib. Once again, butcher it. All right, man. Call Beetlejuice. Don't say it more than th- three times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, he denied it the whole time. Right? Pretty much. Eventually, he had admitted to to it. I uh, kind of owned it and realized it rather. Uh, but he uh, every time he would deny it, and and then Javier Bardem was like, "See, he would he would even deny. That's what the that's what the Messiah would do. He that's would deny being the Messiah." Yeah. And like there was, it was, it was so awesome. The comic relief from him was on point, yeah. bar none. He was probably one of the biggest linchpins or glues to keeping holding this movie together contextually, uh, for the flow. Like I- incredible. If he doesn't win something off of this, obviously we know that the you know the, certain things are rigged. But th- I, I would put money on it that something was rigged the wrong way because, dude, he he was hilarious. He he was a believable character, almost as if somebody was recording real time, a person that was believing in a, a specific religion and you know and a messiah, and how they kind of tied in. If you look not even that deep uh, into the movie itself, they kind of tied it into a lot of things you know related to uh, you know our real life world here. You know, seemingly different religions, different sects, um, as well as I mean. Stuff, you know, stuff in Star uh, Star Wars or whatever. And from my understanding, they, you know, that's where Star Wars got some of its, uh, you know, its its inspiration, inspiration, so yeah. to speak, was from that the book. Um, but yeah, he was just amazing. There was one point in particular I was joking with Eric, where you know Javier was he, he was kind of standing there. I'm sure he had his fingers behind, you know, crossed behind his back, hoping that uh, everything would work out and he'd be the you know the the Messiah, and then. He did something, and then all he's like, "Yeah, yeah, see, see, I told I you it. he was the Messiah. That's that's exactly what the Messiah would do." And kind of looking around, like, hey, "Yeah, yeah, exactly." I'm, I, do I, I think that was myself? the worm. I think when he was gonna yeah. ride that worm, because like, man, this yeah. one is the biggest one we've ever seen. And he's like, "Oh no, if he doesn't do this, man, it's, it's gonna be it. it." So yeah, he had his fingers crossed, but he had that face. But also, I gotta yeah. give a shout out to Austin Butler. Oh God, Fade, yeah. Fade Rowler. All oh, kind of uh, was Freeze from Dragon Ball Z. Freeza? Like, yeah, Freeza. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the dude was, he was sinister, and he was, like, ruthless. You know what I mean? And I like the way he he took ownership of who he was, right? He was like, oh, yeah, I don't need the protection that they're giving me. But I will, I'll fight you without it, you know? So he was he was pretty, pretty sick. I like him. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know how long he'll be around, but... I did like that character. Yeah, I, I I thought he was I thought he was pretty good, but I'm gonna flip that coin over. So, um, you know, me and the guys have talked about it. When it comes to these movies, the Dunes, uh, in my mind, this is actually Dune three, not two, because the first one was Dune. Yeah, so they can you can call it what you want, put it in the comment sections uh, section. But I will say, in my opinion, Sting was a better villain. Um, the, like just said no one else. <laughs> yeah, except the winners. Yeah, yeah. Sting, Sting, Sting did it better uh, than he did. Although I do think that he did a good job. I'll say I was I was disappointed, um, not in his overall performance. I thought he did great, uh, but I was I was disappointed in his stage time, right? His, his screen time. He didn't get a whole lot, in my opinion. I think they could have dev the character out a little more. They could have he could have got more screen time, and definitely. The the main confrontation uh, confrontation that I think everybody was waiting for was the fight between him and Paul, and it was lackluster at best in my opinion. The choreography not nothing against the guys who did it. I'm sure that took a lot of work. Um, shout out to you guys, but the choreography I think overall was par at best, more more subpar. They could have had more of a fight, and. He, you know, he used his voice like twice, once to kind of whisper to somebody and make him do it. And then one time he used it again against the Bene Jesuit or Jesuit. And, oh. um, Two. yeah, it was, it was, it was like something you would expect from like an eight year old that had it, maybe, maybe even younger. Because if you go back to the original, when he used his voice, he like cracked the ground in a guy's well body down, right? yeah. that was down there. It was insane. And I was expecting more, I was expecting that kind of a voice to come out when he used it, uh, or maybe even during the fight, right? During that fight, that, that big confrontational fight between the two, 
everybody's kind of crowded around. I was expecting maybe use the voice. Nah, not so much. Fight scene, like I said, was kind of lackluster. And it was just, eh, you know, I mean, it it didn't impress. Um, so I'm sure the guy's a great actor is going to go, you know, to amazing heights. But um, nah, he didn't get enough stage time for me. And uh, he didn't, he, he definitely wasn't better than Sting, said everybody. Well, okay, now for you kids at home, when he says Sting, he's referring to the 72-year-old singer and not the 64-year-old wrestler. No, actually, I'm 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 referring to I think he was probably in his late 20-year-old singer at yeah. the time. 1984, dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but the Sting that you were talking about wasn't 64 years old in that time frame either. So, yeah, we're, we'll keep an area. We have to let correct. the young people know who you're talking about. One yeah. of the best singers ever, but I think we're getting uh, off topic. Much. Oh, that's debatable. That well, that's, really that's a that yeah, that's definitely a, another content. His most popular song is about stalking. <laughs> wow, you listen to some of the popular songs now and uh, then get back to me. Right, right. Wrong. This, is, this is the rail. This is us. Yeah. Yes, back on the rail. <laughs> I gotta say though, man, if uh, going back to the the performances in this movie, like I can't. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, Javier Bardem is, is – I'm all in. I, I do think he's number one. But, like, everybody brought their A game, in my opinion. Um, even the two – okay. Even the two old, younger people in the movie, right? Uh, Zendala and Timothy Chalamet, or is probably most known as, is, like, the Taylor Swift of Hollywood because he's – everybody's all famous and favorite these days. But, hey, man, that dude and her knocked it out of the park. I, I got to say it, man. Like, I wasn't a huge fan of them, especially uh, Zendala. Like, I didn't – I couldn't stand her in Spider-Man. Granted, I, I'm not a big Spider-Man fan either, but I just thought she played it too safe. And then in this movie, she is friggin' phenomenal, man. Like, every sequence and with every actor is just awesome. Um, It was nice to see Josh Brolin come back as Gurney. Uh, it was just a... So, I mean, okay, so over the... Over the time span, basically, you don't have an internal clock of what's going on in the movie. But what what it boils down to is you're following the progression of Paul's sister, her development in the womb. And you're actually seeing some sequences to it. And it's the only thing that I could kind of use to judge how much time has passed. And my best estimate uh, is like six to eight months uh, because his mother goes through the pregnancy during the movie. Um, and that's a cool little cameo. I won't ruin it for anybody. I'm sure you can find it on IMDb. Not a big deal. Um but yeah, seeing Josh Brolin come back was good. But man, everybody else just shines. Uh, it, it's Stellan Skarsgård as the uh, as the Baron, man. Oof. Yeah, first, dude was both phenomenal. Movies, both movies, yeah. If if I had to find something that I was going to complain about with this movie, I'd say that the action sequences were a little trimmed down, probably for pacing of the movie. But like this major assault sequence at the end with the sandworms and everything is awesome. But then they just cut it, um, and they're because they're moving the story inside, and maybe it was over cost production or something like that. I don't know. I haven't even bothered to look into it, but like that was the only thing that I'd be like, man, I'd like to see just a little bit more of that. Um, but Harvey R. Bardem is like the senior NCO of the crew, man. Like he's <laughs> hilarious. Cause like, he's like, good luck. He's like, you're either going to do great or you're going to die. And I was that's like, it. yeah, dude, that's some shit we would say to each other. There you go. That's yeah. It. He was, he, he was definitely phenomenal. Like we can't, we can't avoid going back to him. I, I would say, I don't know, off the top of my head, if I was to kind of try and rack and stack who I think had the best performance, because overall, everybody had a great performance. You can't take anything away from any of the actors. Uh, but I will say, uh, probably closer to the bottom of the list, definitely not at the top, main actor, Tim O'Tay, right? Uh, Paul Atreides. Uh, I think he did a great job, but I thought he was out, I, and I've never seen the Spider-Man, by the way, but I think he was out-acted. Uh, are outperformed by Zendaya. Uh, but I would say my number one's going to be Javier. He, he's number one, first and foremost, uh, for me in that, you know, throughout the entire movie. And he had some incredible scenes, and it'd probably go to Josh Brolin. Although I think Josh Brolin and Batista, they, that's another downside. They didn't really have a, you know, a fight. fight. Like, I was expecting the, those two, especially going back to the recap, I was expecting a big confrontation between those two. And it just kind of, it wasn't there for me on that, but still the acting was phenomenal. Um, I, I like Bat Batista, but he's uh, down towards the bottom of the list. Uh, and then I will say the Baron, uh, to be honest, like he'd probably be next for me. I think he did a phenomenal job at the as a Baron. I think he was a better Baron, and and I prefer the very first one. He was a better Baron than the original Baron. I think like that was. 
they I don't think they could pick anybody better to be the Baron than him. And um, yeah, it, I mean, you know, Christopher Walken being in there, he had some small role, um, small small parts in there. So I, I really can't give a whole lot to him, but he, he's Christopher Walken. So I'm sure even behind the scenes, he was uh, he was phenomenal, just you know, inspiring all the rest of the younger actors and actresses. But that's funny. That's kind of how I would stack it, um, in my opinion. What I thought about what was funny with Chris Walken was that, uh, yeah, we're like that. I, I just call him Chris. He's cool with it. Yeah. Um, what I like about him in that movie is he is fighting back his mannerisms of just doing <laughs> standard Christopher Walken stuff. More and cowbell. Kinda, yeah, and you could kind of catch it a couple times. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that kind of thing. Like, I'd do a <laughs> shitty impersonation of Christopher Walken. But, like, More you can kind of see cowbell. Like, he was putting the, the effort into it, man. <laughs> Uh, and sorry, just to touch back on something I rambled on about for a second was Josh Brolin. When he comes back in, he's all bearded out and everything. And if I remember right in the first film, he was shaved head. So time has elapsed, right? And that's that's kind of a key takeaway. And that's why I think they used the, the, the growth process of his baby sister in the womb to kind of tell a story. Obviously, they're all talking to her, too, which is another thing. Um, but, like, when he meets Gurney back up, he's he's scavenging to survive, right? And all he has yeah. is the revenge. And honestly, Chris, I got I to... Gotta, um, I gotta dispute you. I think the fight scene between him and Batista was warranted because of the buildup of how much Batista's character proved to be a coward. Um, like he went to fight, and he like, I mean, seriously, who pulls out a whip? I mean, this ain't Indiana Jones, man. <laughs> and totally misses with the mip, the whip, and then Brolin just deals him down, man. It's freaking awesome. Yeah, I Batista's thought. like your typical bully. You know, like he picks on a little guy that just has a question, right? Like, well, I don't know if that's going to work. And he bashes the dude's head to the ground. I'm like, that wow. That was so funny, man. All right, Darth. Like, hey, Spike. You know? hey, Spike. Like, if he could have force choked him, he would have. But, like, he just goes off for, like, no reason on the slightest things. But then, like you said, once he's faced with actual confrontation, he's the first one running back to the plane. Oh, yeah. You know, like, oh, get me out of here. You know what I mean? Like, uh, okay, Dave. All right, uh, I see. I see what you're doing there. But, yeah, their uh, fight look... scene. What? Oh, go ahead. No, no, and, and 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 also too. It talking about that fight scene between Atreides and um, Frey Powder. Frey, uh, powder, yeah. Uh, Frieza. The it shows you the importance <clears throat> of a soundtrack, or you know, like because it was there was no sound, right? It was just like the clang of the weapons. There was no like you know that John Williams, you know. Dun, 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 dun. It was none of that. So it does really affect how you see a fight scene. If you look at any fight scene in history, and if it has that that type of music, and you take that out, yeah. it's like, wow, it, it is different. It's significantly different. Yeah. It's like watching a comedy with no laugh track, right? It's like, oh, it's not that funny when you don't hear laughter in the background, you know, some, sometimes. <laughs> but it's just like, it, it, music is so important, and I, I kind of equate that to... By Guardians of the Galaxy, for me, it was the soundtrack that really put that movie over the top for me. All three of them. And the third one, it kind of missed a little bit. And I think it showed. I'm like, okay, guys, you guys were hit with the first two. And that third one, you kind of fell off the cliff. So just to say that that music is important to, to, to sell some scenes. But that fight scene, yeah, it was quick. But it was effective. It was a good fight scene. It was it was a good choreographed scene. This wasn't very long. Yeah, I would, well... Yeah, you guys kind of know my opinion, but I, yeah, I, I disagree with the choreography on it. But um, I would say it's par for the course for most of the one-on-one -on -one fights. They're all pretty short. Him in the arena, you know, short. It, it, that was lackluster. I thought that could have been done a lot better. Yeah, they tried to do, you know, a little bit of the gladiator touch, you know, are you entertained kind of a thing. But um, I, I, the one-on-ones <clears throat> the -on I thought was lackluster. And, yeah, although they did have a fight scene, it was, it was super short and – I, I just expected a little more from that, but I would say overall, like the CGI on this, the, like the expanse of things when they were, when, when he kind of came into the center and everybody and said, there's nobody here that can challenge me, blah, blah, blah. And the amount of people, how they were able to get that in, it looked real. It looked like there were, you know, millions of people in an underground kind of a layer thing was just insane. I thought that was awesome. The nuclear explosions, the, the effect of that and, and the backdrop was money. So, yeah, overall, I think you know, the movie's got to win multiple awards, just not for fight scenes. <laughs> yeah, definitely cinematography. And sound. I mean, let's can, oh. can we not, like, can we talk about that? Yep. Can we talk about the sound a little bit? Sound effects? I, I can't hear anything now. I couldn't hear before, oh. but I definitely can't hear now. Um, it is the loudest yet quietest movie you'll ever see. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> 
like with the machines and, and everything going, it's loud when it comes time to having a conversation. It's like, is that English? Because they, they are speaking a different language at parts of the movie. So they're like, I don't, I don't know what they're saying. Okay. Something, somebody's mad. Someone's upset. Okay, he pulled out a knife. Okay, they're fighting. That's really the only way you know when he when pulls out a weapon. Okay, got it. But other than that, I mean, that's partially my, my bad hearing. But um, it is points to that movie that are very loud, and as I'm sure uh, uh, Chris can Dude. attest to that. Yeah, I was going to say, not at all. That's the reason why I got these up here. Like, I, honestly, I wish I had remembered or thought to bring my Peltors because, oh, my gosh, that was deafening. It was like being on a being on a range with a, a fifty and no ear pro. At, at some points, it was like a taking a you know one of those needles that they had to the side of his neck in the ear. Uh, and speaking of which, well, one one improvement I will say that they made in this movie, amongst many, uh, over the 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 one from the eighties uh, eighty four, uh, which, which was kind of funny. Uh, so the the body shields, right? How they they kind of put on the little they, they usually have it on the, you know on the body here or here on like a little wrist thing that kind of turned it on. Um, and that same thing in, in uh, part one, but the original, they, they look like some characters out of, out of Minecraft. Like it was extremely blocky, like glass, like a, a like a glass house at the, at the fair where you're, you're kind of cut up into pieces. Um, it was really, really, really weird, especially watching, you know, Paul fight uh, a then younger John Luke Picard. Um, in kind of a sparring thing, and it looked like two Minecraft characters uh, go, going to, you know, fisticuffs. It was insane. So they did an outstanding job um, on part one uh, of the new one, and then now on part two, I think they did a great job with that. So the Fremen never realized that they could grab the shield device and actually use it in their favor? Like, that was one thing I was just kind of, like, there's a couple things, like, how do you park a sandworm? How do you actually get off? Like, is there like a, a PLF? Little, what is that? <laughs> that Navy ramp that you guys put on your boats? I don't know. That thing? I don't know. Not Navy. You're talking about the uh, brow? That, whatever, sure. It sounds good. You yeah. walk up it, right? Like, do they just have those on, like, on their bag, on their backs? Do they Dude, lower it off the sandworm? Does it, yeah, I, I have questions, man. Like, is that yeah, a whole thing? control PLF. them? Do they get, like, cruise control? Or are they hanging on for the whole time? Like, so many questions. They were in the they soft eat? sand. They were they they were in a hard pack. They were in soft sand. They just jump and yeah. hope for the best. Hope the <laughs> hope the worm doesn't just run them over and they <laughs> fall underneath. Best me- beach movie you'll ever watch. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But yeah, man. Not, like I said, I I think overall it was a great movie. If I was to say on my scale uh, from one to ten what it would be, I would I would honestly, and this is kind of high for me when it comes to movies. I would say I'd probably give it. An eight, maybe eight point five, um, with regards to movies and, and how I like them. Um, just some minor tweaks here and there, but they they did phenomenal. They're going to win a ton of stuff off this. Uh, I disagree with a lot of people who say that the, you know the soundtrack, the music, the soundtrack to this was amazing. Like, I just heard a whole bunch of people. Eh, that was about it. Um, so really, the soundtrack wasn't a big thing. The CGI though, the expanse. You know, whether it was out in space, whether it was on the planet, inside of buildings, all of that stuff, I think they, they more than got right. Um, the script was amazing. So all in all, from my point of view, it, it, it was a money movie, and it's a must-see in the theaters. Preferably one of the bigger screens if you can. you got to do that. And bring Air Pro, dude. Bring your, bring your Air yeah, Pro. Yes, yes, definitely. And it does, and then for those of you who love a tight ending, this leaves the opening for a part three. So don't go into this theater looking for closure. You're not going to get closure, but you will be entertained. You so definitely go check it out. And that way you can get ready for part three. So I, I got to say, like, I've never read the books, but my understanding and a uh, chat comments, whatever. Hey, hit us up in the comments and let us know if we're right. In the, in the book, though, I understand that the book ends at this point in the second movie. Uh, so like one and two are the first book. And then they're, the concept is to roll basically Dune 3 into Dune Messiah is the title I've heard or the next book. I'm not sure, but I thought the ending was, was great. I still had questions and that was the thing, man. Like that's a good movie when you're like, man, I've got, I, I want to see more of this universe because like I'm, I am all in. I sound like Absolutely. John Wick when I want everything explained to me, but, but there's some aspects of this where I definitely want an explanation on some of this stuff. And they're doing the, uh, HBO is going to do a Jesuit. Je, I'm butchering that. Jesuits. 
Jesuits, thank you. Uh, they're doing a series on them. What I don't know is where it takes place chronologically, if it's going to be after this and then kind of building up in the Messiah or if it's like a standalone prequel kind of storyline. Either way, I'm all in, man. Dune Universe, count me in. Done. Likewise. Cool beans. Well, I mean, hopefully <clears throat> you guys like the, uh, the review on this one. Um, I like the movie, which is contrary to what I thought I was going to <laughs> feel. I was going into this like now because I still love the very first, but great movie, man. Um, I, I, I don't have anything else other than a lot of kudos, very little uh, gripes about it. Yeah, thanks again, guys. Beards of War out. Till next time. Hey, follow us on Instagram. Later, yeah, so give us on Instagram. Do that. Come on, man. Help us out. Click notification. Make us now. better. The <laughs> gauntlet right, has been thrown down. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate you coming out and checking us out.